one, the hits. Welcome to Learning English on the Voice of America. I'm Katie Weaver. Our 30-minute show is designed for people learning English. Coming up on the show, our programs Ask a Teacher and American Stories. But first, we hear from Gregory Stockel. A 57-year-old Tonga man survived a night in the ocean after a tsunami wave swept him out to sea last Saturday. The incident happened after the huge burst of a volcano in the island kingdom of Tonga. Lisa Falau told Tonga's Broadcom Broadcasting that he was painting his house last Saturday when his brother told him a tsunami was moving toward the small island of Atata. The island has a population of about 60. Falau is disabled and has difficulty walking. He said he climbed a tree to escape the first wave, but when he got down, another big wave swept him away. I could hear my son calling from land. But I didn't want to answer my son because I didn't want him to swim out to find me, said Falau. Falau was swept out to sea at about 7 p.m. local time. Then he said he drifted or swam another eight hours to a second island with no one living on it before finally swimming again to the main island of Tongatapu. The experience lasted more than 27 hours and covered 7.5 kilometers. Falau said that he went underwater nine times. On the eighth time, I thought, the next time I go underwater, that's it, because my arms were the only things that were keeping me above water, said Lisa La Falau. He told Reuters, So the ninth time I went under and came up and grabbed a log, and that's what kept me going. In an interview with Britain's Sky News, Falau said he was frightened when the waves took him from land into the sea. What came into my mind when I was helpless at sea were two things, he said. He added, one, that I still had faith in God. Two, is my family. And I only remember how my family will think at that moment. Maybe he died. New Zealand's acting High Commissioner Peter Lund said Tongan officials told him last Sunday that a man was missing from Atata Island, and they weren't very optimistic about it, Lund said. Video shows that almost nothing was left standing on the island other than a church, where many of the villagers took shelter. It's one of these miracles that happens, Lund told the Associated Press. The story of Falau's survival went viral among Tongan groups on Facebook and other social media. Real life Aquaman, said one post on Facebook, referring to the comic book and movie character. When asked if he knew who Aquaman was, Falau said he did not. I'm Gregory Stockel.
Researchers have found more evidence that one of the world's most common viruses may be linked to the disease multiple sclerosis. MS causes the body's own immune system to mistakenly attack nerve cells. It destroys the protective material that covers nerve tissue. The Epstein-Barr virus has long been suspected of playing a part in the development of MS. But a connection is hard to prove because just about everybody gets infected with Epstein-Barr, but few develop MS. Last week, Harvard researchers reported one of the largest studies yet to support the possible link between the virus and MS. They studied a supply of blood samples from usual medical tests on more than 10 million members of the American military. The samples cover a period from 1993 to 2013. The scientists searched the samples for antibodies signaling viral infection. They found that the risk of MS increased by 32 times following Epstein-Barr infection. Only 5.3% of the sampled group were free of signs of the virus when they joined the military. The researchers compared 801 MS cases found later over the 20-year period with 1,566 service members who never got MS. Only one of the MS patients had no evidence of the Epstein-Barr virus before their MS diagnosis. And the researchers found no evidence that other viral infections were involved. The findings strongly suggest that Epstein-Barr infection is a cause and not a consequence of MS. Study leader Alberto Asherio and his team reported in the publication Science. Dr. Asherio is with the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. The virus appears to be the initial trigger, Dr. William H. Robinson and Dr. Lawrence Steinman of Stanford University wrote in a report alongside the study. Epstein-Barr is best known for causing mono, or infectious mononucleosis, in teenagers and young adults. The virus remains inactive in the body after infection and has been linked to later development of some autoimmune diseases, including MS, and rare cancers. It is not clear why. Some scientists think the body is tricked by viral proteins that look very much like nerve proteins. Whatever the cause may be, the new study is the strongest evidence to date that Epstein-Barr contributes to cause MS, said Mark Allegretta. He is vice president for research at the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. American television star and political commentator John Stewart has been named winner of the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor. The award is presented by the John F. Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. It honors people who have influenced others in the field of the performing arts. Stewart whose birth name is Jonathan Stuart Leibowitz, is 59 years old. He rose to fame as a stand-up comedian and host of several talk shows. His popularity grew most 
after he joined The Daily Show in 1999. He hosted the satirical news program for 16 years on the Comedy Central television channel. Through exploration and sharply funny criticism of politics and culture, Stewart came to influence what many people thought about some issues in the United States. In 2004, Stewart gained wide attention for an appearance on a CNN political debate show called Crossfire. The comedian said the hosts of the show, a conservative and a liberal, did not provide honest, productive arguments. He told the two men that they had a responsibility to the public discourse and were failing at it. You're doing theater when you should be doing debate, said Stewart, in an openly hostile exchange with one host. What you do is not honest. What you do is partisan hackery. Stewart's appearance made him even more popular with the public than before. Crossfire was cancelled three months later. Since retiring from The Daily Show in 2015, Stewart has become a supporter of several social causes. He is active in efforts to get better health care for emergency workers in New York City who responded to the 9-11 terrorist attacks in 2001. More recently, he returned to television as host of The Problem with Jon Stewart on Apple TV+. Plus. For me, tuning into his television programs over the years has always been equal parts entertainment and truth, Kennedy Center President Deborah F. Rutter said in a statement. He demonstrates that we all can make a difference in this world through humor, humanity, and patriotism, she added. Stewart will be presented with the award during a ceremony on April 24th. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from a reader in China. Dear Teacher, I read an article on your website. Visitors slowly return to a famous Thai coastal area. I am a little confused about the words restore and recover in the story. Is there any difference between them? Thank you. You are loyal reader. I ping China. Dear Ai Ping, thank you for this question. The story tells of a famous place, Maya Bay, in Thailand. A movie was filmed there. Too many people visited this island, and it became polluted. Fish and wildlife disappeared from its waters. In 2018, the government closed it. Now it is open again, and a smaller number of people can visit it. The story ends with this quote from an Italian visitor. I think it is fine that it has been closed all this time to protect the nature and allow it to restore and recover. Let us look first at the word restore. It means to give back something that was lost or taken. In the case of Maya Bay, the beautiful sea animals, called corals, died from all the traffic in the water. So, 
workers had to plant new coral on the sea floor. In other words, officials restored the reefs by planting new corals from other places. Maya Bay's beach experienced another loss. The native plants that grew there. The movie makers took away some of the plants. They planted trees that are not native to the island. Thai officials tried to correct that environmental damage by bringing back the usual plants that grew in the sand. You can say, marine biologists restored the native plants on the beach. Now let us look at the word recover. It means to get back or regain something that was lost. The ecological system or environment of Maya Bay was lost to pollution. We read that government scientists brought corals and plants back, but they need time to grow. It will take a few years for the beach to recover as the new plants grow. Think of how we use recover to mean become healthy again after an illness. You can say, she recovered quickly from a mild infection. The doctor's care restored her to good health. To review, when we return something that was lost, we restore it. When something goes back to its original state, or the way it was, it recovers. If all goes well, the island at Maya Bay will recover its beauty as the plants, wildlife, and waters return to good health. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Jill Robbins. The Law of Life by Jack London Part 1 Old Kashkus listened greedily. Although his sight had failed, his hearing remained good. The slightest sound was recognized by a mind yet active behind the aged forehead. Ah, that was Sitcom Ha, shouting curses at the dogs as she beat them into the harnesses. Sitcom Ha was his daughter's daughter, but she was too busy to waste a thought upon her old grandfather sitting alone there in the snow. Camp must be broken. The long trail waited while the short day refused to delay. Life called her, and the duties of life, not death. And he was very close to death now. The thought frightened the old man for a moment. He stretched forth a shaking hand, which wandered over the small pile of dried wood beside him. Reassured that it was there, his hand returned to the shelter of his old, worn furs. He again began to listen. He heard the noise of the half-frozen animal skins being moved. He knew that even then the chief's moose-kin tent was being packed. The chief was his son, leader of the tribesmen and a mighty hunter. As the women worked, his voice rose, exclaiming at their slowness. Old Kaskush strained his ears. It was the last time he would hear that voice. There went Greenhouse Tent, and Tuskens, seven, eight, nine. Only the medicine mans could yet be standing. There, they were at work upon it now, 
He could hear the medicine man struggling loudly as he piled it on the sled. A child cried and a woman calmed it with gentle singing. Little Koo Tea, the old man thought. That child was always weeping, and it was sickly. It would die soon, perhaps, and they would burn a hole through the frozen ground and pile rocks above to keep the wolves away. And what difference would it make? A few years at best, and as many an empty stomach as a full one, and in the end, death waited, ever hungry and hungriest of them all. What was that? Ah, oh, the men binding the sleds together and drawing tight the ropes. He listened, he who would listen no more. The whips whistled among the dogs. Hear them howl! <laughs> How they hated the work and the trail through the snow. They had started. Sled after sled moved slowly away into the silent forest. And they were gone. They had passed out of his life, and he faced the last bitter hour alone. No. The step of a moccasin broke the snow's surface. A man stood beside him. Upon his head a hand rested gently. His son was good to do this thing. He remembered other old men whose sons had not waited after the tribe had gone. But his son had. The old man's thoughts wandered away into the past until the young man's voice returned him to the present. It is well with you, he asked. The old man answered, It is well. There is wood beside you, the younger man continued, and the fire burns bright. The morning is grey, and the cold has lessened. It will snow presently. Even now it is snowing. Yes, even now it is snowing. The tribesmen hurry. Their loads are heavy and their stomachs empty with lack of feasting. The trail ahead is long and they travel fast. I go now. Is it well? It is well. I am as a last year's leaf hanging lightly on a branch. When the first wind blows, I fall. My voice has become like an old woman's. My eyes no longer show me the way of my feet, and my feet are heavy, and I am tired. It is well. He bowed his head in contentment until the last noise of the moccasin on the snow died away. He knew his son was beyond recall. Then his hand moved out from the firs to touch the wood. It alone stood between him and what lay beyond the death that opened before him. Now the measure of his life was a handful of sticks. One by one they would go to feed the fire. And just so, step by step, death would come closer to him. When the last stick had given all of its heat, the frost would begin to gather strength. First his feet would yield, then his hands, and the lack of feeling would travel slowly to his body. His head would fall forward upon his knees, and he would rest. It was easy. All men must die. He did not murmur. It was the law of life, and it was just. He had been born close to the earth, and close to the earth had he lived. Its law was not new to him. It was the law of all flesh, nature. 
was not kindly to the flesh. She had no concern for that single thing called the individual. Her interest lay in the race of man as a whole. He grasped this idea firmly. He saw its truth displayed everywhere. The awakening of life in a tree, the bursting greenness of its branches, the fall of the yellow leaf. In this alone was told the whole history. But one task nature did give the individual. Did he not perform it, he died. Did he perform it? It was all the same. He died. <laughs> Nature did not care. There were plenty who would obey. It was only the need that this duty be obeyed, not the man who obeyed it, which lived and lived always. The tribe of Kashkush was very old. The old men he had known when he was a boy had known old men before them. Therefore it was true that the tribe lived, that it represented the obeying of all its members, whose final resting places were unremembered. They were not important. They were chapters in life's story. They had passed away like clouds from a summer sky. He also would pass away. Nature did not care. To life she gave one task and one law. To continue the race was the task of life. Its law was death. A young girl was a good creature to look upon full-breasted and strong, with a lightness to her step and a shine in her eyes. But her task was yet before her. The light in her eyes brightened and her step quickened. She laughed with the young men, then she turned away. She passed on to them her own unrest, and she grew fairer and yet fairer to look upon. Finally, some hunter took her to his tent to cook and work for him and to become the mother of his children. And with the coming of her children, her beauty left her. She dragged her legs and arms when she walked. Her eyes lost their brightness. Then only the little ones found joy in the old lined face. Her task was done. In a little while, in the first famine or in the first long trail, she would be left, as he had been left in the snow, with a little pile of wood. Such is the law. He placed a stick carefully on the fire and returned to his thoughts. It was the same everywhere, with all things. The insects disappeared with the first frost. When age settled upon the rabbit, it became slow and heavy and could no longer run faster than its enemies. Even the big bear grew old and blind to be dragged down at last by a small group of barking sled dogs. He remembered how he had left his own father along the Klondike River one winter. It was the winter before the missionary came with his books and his box of medicines. Many times Kashkush had recalled with pleasure the taste of those medicines. The one called Painkiller was especially good. But now his mouth refused to moisten. He remembered that the missionary had become a worry to them. He brought no meat into the camp, and he ate much. The hunters did not like this. Then, when they were near the mayo, he became ill. And afterward, the dogs pushed the stones away and fought for his bones. And that is our show for today. I'm Katie Weaver. Thanks 
for listening.